to speak about her good work. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. I guess I should really be thanking you for getting up early and showing up. Most of you I know had celebrations last night, so I appreciate your uh, open eyes this morning. I'm gonna talk to you about One Health a little bit and so those interactions between uh, people, animals, and the environment. And I thought just to get us started off because we are talking about moving forward. These guys are trying to move forward, um, probably also early in the morning. Um, and I wonder if we think about it from a public health perspective and a One Health perspective, thinking about the animals and the people and the environment, who's, who's at most risk in this picture? How many people would say it's the guy with the green cap in the front? Probably most of us, when we first look at this, we would think, oh yeah, that guy, he's gonna run into that 800 pound sea lion and there might be some trouble. Some of you, if you are coming from the wildlife perspective, you might say, I'm worried about the sea lion. He's gonna get um, you know, trampled by all these triathletes. The guy in the back who can actually see what's going on maybe is most worried there, um, he, he, he might uh, decide not to move forward uh, in, that, in that scenario. But really when we think about it from a, a disease perspective and a One Health perspective, they're all kind of at risk, probably most in this current situation from leptospirosis. Because uh, we know that sometimes people urinate while they're uh, moving forward in a triathlon. And the people in the back, again, that blue cap guy, may be the one at most danger. The sea lions also get lepto. Um, and of course, the environment receives it often from uh, domestic animals and other kinds of coastal runoff. So just. Uh, to break the ice a little bit more, um, I think we're all in a place where we ha we're dealing with the media and we're dealing with public perspectives. And that's good for us in some ways, as you know, because we think about um, understanding how now our parents understand what we do for jobs, right? Um, because they know about diseases that, that transmit between animals and people. Um, but also the, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so how do we manage this incredible pool of uh, emerging diseases and existing diseases, maybe expanding their host range, um, and not scare people, but also make sure people understand their risks? Well, I work, as I mentioned, at, these, at this interface, and I think it's really exciting, but we have to think about what's driving the emergence of disease. And so when we think about land use change and human population growth, how that brings us into contact with animals and more intimately in contact with our environment, um, we realize that there can be this enhanced flow of pathogens. Of course, that leads to potential health risks for the animals and the people. And then um, though all those things, especially in the developing world, change livelihood impacts and economic pressures. And the tough thing is, is when you have these livelihood impacts and economic pressures, that tends to change the way we use land, it tends to change where we live. It pushes us. Um, it forces migration and changes things. That starts this whole cycle going in an even more tense way. So you can feel that, that whirlpool starting. Why am I here today talking to you really about these emerging infectious diseases and especially from wildlife? Um, well, I think most of you know that the majority of emerging infectious diseases in people are zoonotic. Um, and 75% of these can be traced to wildlife origins. Now, we use that a lot. It helps us get funding. But um, I, I don't want to say that statement like it's so amazing or shocking. If you think about it, we are more likely to have diseases um, in us, well, the pathogens in us are less likely to cause disease because we've evolved with them. So it's when we have a spillover event where we notice an explosive disease or we see disease that um, we might not pick up otherwise. So it's these spillover events from animals to people that are more likely to be characterized as an emergency 
damaging infectious disease. So things that evolve in wild animals, if they're in their host, less likely to cause severe disease, but when it spills over to a domestic animal or directly into a person or a population, we start to detect it. We have been able to link activities at these interfaces um, to the, uh, the majority of the big scary emerging infectious diseases like SARS and Ebola and Nipah. And I think it's also important to characterize as we move forward through this um, presentation that annual population growth is among the highest in the buffer areas to wildlife um, zones. And so what that means is this vicious cycle, the people living with that um, intimate contact with animals and people, that's where they're explosively changing their populations. Um, also those people tend to be the most underrepresented in their governments and may have the least access to education and health care, so things might cook along there longer um, before they're recognized by people like us. This is my home. Um, and in the Sacramento River, we're not supposed to have whales. So um, I think it's also an interesting thing to think about animal migration and why do animals suddenly migrate in a different way than um, they should, just like people moving. We, we do it for lots of different reasons, mostly for resources, right? So it's the same for people and animals, and sometimes we get off track, sometimes they get off track. This one probably because of uh, demoke acid and changes in toxins in the environment, and we could talk about that. I think we're gonna hear some things about how climate and other activities um, can change the way that um, diseases emerge. I wonder if you look at this picture, if you, if you think about who's healthier Who's at more or less risk for emerging infectious diseases? I think sometimes we think about the big city as being the perfect place to be able to have access to health care. People are probably more aware. They're watching CNN. They're um, Googling, right? Um, and so they may be more likely to pick things up. Um, but they're also in closer contact, and they're mixing, and they're sharing, and they're moving around the world a little bit more than the people in the top photo. But those people in the top photo are probably the ones that have more intimate contact with the environment and animals. So it is this um, impact and this mixing that really is the issue. In the United States, I believe we have more than a million international flights landing per day. And we also have um, over, just in my uh, state in California, over a million border crossings per day. So really we can get from that that very, very rural area um, into the city with a pathogen anywhere from 24 to 48 hours um, from most places in the world. Also, I think even though the awareness about um, zoonotic diseases is increasing, it's very, very difficult to change behavior. I'm sure some of you in the audience have been smokers, even though you knew it was bad for you. Um, I'm sure some of you might have had a cocktail last night. Um, so we have behaviors that we, that we do um, that may or may not be safe in moderation, may or may not be safe um, at all. This is my friend Zay Salendu, and this is his, um, some of the women in his household. And when I first visited him in rural Tanzania, uh, his wives told me, well, you know, we boil the milk. We boil all the milk. Um, and I said, oh, okay, really, can I hang out with you today? Yeah, sure, you know, and by the end of the day, we we're a little more connected, and even though I needed a translator, I don't speak Ma yet. Um, they, they offered me milk from that gourd right out of the cow, and I said, whoa, I thought you said you boil the milk, and they said, yeah, we tell Mzungu's that, and I said, w w that means white girl, by the way. Um, I said, uh, why, why, do you, why do you tell me that? Um, well, we know you think we should boil the milk, that it's better for us. I said, so you're aware, yeah, we're aware there's risks. Um, our cows aren't sick, there are pets, just like probably some of you let your dogs or cats get up on your bed, some of you, I bet, even secretly let them lick your mouth, give you kisses, um, right? <laughs> So, um, so same with them. My pet is healthy. I love my cow. This is part of my family. They're not going to get me sick, right? And oh, by the way, for hundreds to thousands of years, we've been drinking raw milk, um, and we don't think we get sick. 
So uh, in working with them and testing their cows, and also they said, you know, people test, they study us, but they don't come back and tell us what our animals have. And so in working with them and testing their cows and coming back and showing them which cows were infected with brucellosis and which cows were infected with tuberculosis, they started boiling the milk from those cows. Okay, so a little baby change, um, and really truly for the babies, they really boil the milk for the babies because they don't like the taste difference. So they started to change a little bit, but more because it wasn't just some academician or public health person coming and saying, you should do this. It was working with them and showing them what was going on in their household. Now, the real thing we told them was they should kill those cows, but they wouldn't because they're their pets. Um, so we have to think about different strategies. But my friend, Mzee Salendu, recently died of tuberculosis in his bones. Okay? And he was the head of that household. So now they're thinking about a little bit more significant behavior change because he was their patriarch. But it's... I wish we could get to a place where you don't have to have that personal attention and personal tragedy to change behavior. And that is really the challenge, I think, for all of us here today. Back to zoonoses. If, again, if we think about how this works and we think about wildlife, um, as things cook along in wildlife, um, they may spill over to other wildlife species and you may get a blip. Um, that is potentially detectable uh, as an emerging infectious disease. However, um, often we don't monitor wildlife that well, um, and things get scavenged and cleaned up very quickly in wild lands um, by uh, other predators and scavengers. So we probably won't pick up diseases in wildlife that are important for public health by just looking for outbreaks. Um, where we're more likely to pick up those outbreaks is when we see that spillover event to domestic animals or people. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to keep going with the current scenario. And I'm sure some of you have been in this situation and have been frustrated about how long it takes to really go from the first case of disease to actually detecting it and confirming it. If you can confirm it, if it's an emerging infectious disease, that may be impossible with our current techniques. It's not impossible, but improbable. Um, and so then the response period is very, very small. And um, in working with the United States Agency for International Development, they were paying a lot of money, billions of dollars, to send vaccine overseas to be used for this very small window of opportunity. So really, they were sending vaccines after the fact. And I think they, they, they wanted to change their strategy. And so what we're trying to do with um, the Emerging Pandemic Threats Program of USAID is change the way we look at outbreaks and be better prepared for them, but not just prepared for response, but be watching. Um, now, how do you watch for things that haven't emerged yet? I think that's the big challenge. One thing we can do is we can get behind that curve and start to understand more about what's out there. And the other thing we can do is to find new ways to pick up um, those new emerging pathogens. So what we want to do is, is understand what we're looking for and how we're looking for it so that when there is that first case, we narrow this detecting and confirmation window so that our response has the likelihood of having an impact. Okay, so the challenge for the overall Emerging Pandemic Threats Program is to develop the strategic framework for identifying and responding to pathogens of pandemic potential that have not yet emerged. That is a big challenge, and that's what we've been faced with, um, I, I was tasked with a couple of years ago. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the way that we've approached it. We have a wonderful consortium. Some of the members are here today and on the panel, so um, we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. I'm really only going to talk to you about one piece of that puzzle, and that's the, what we call the PREDICT project. It's all caps. USAID likes acronyms. It is not an acronym. So, um, and I didn't name it, um, but uh, we, we maybe are predicting something. Mostly we're looking for stuff, 
so we'll talk about that. But we are working only um, internationally because, again, USAID only is allowed to work internationally. So we could talk about that in the questions if you want um, about domestically what this means. Um, but I'm going to use the examples from very low resource countries, um, 20 countries around the world. And I think what we're finding in those extremely resource limited settings are some things that we can really learn from and and use here uh, that are cheap. And, and that's always an issue when we're trying to figure out how to do um, surveillance. These are the countries we're working in. Um, and as you can see, they're pretty much, um, you know, in tropical areas except China. We're working in the more tropical part of China. And how we do our, our surveillance system, it, this one's an acronym for USAID SMART. So it's strategic, manageable, <laughs> adaptive, responsive, and targeted. Clearly in 20 countries, we couldn't afford to just go and look for everything in wildlife that might uh, spill over into people. So we developed a strategy that's very targeted by using mathematical modeling and information um, gathering systems, and then intensive field studies at those interfaces that I mentioned and then laboratory investigations that then feed back into the models. And this is kind of our strategy. I'm going to take you through the first kind of pale pink box, the initial surveillance targeting to explain really how we're doing that, how we're gathering the information. And then as we move through our system, obviously once you find a potential pathogen, there's a lot more work to do to get to the place where you know how to prioritize it for uh, response and follow-up. We started with uh, risk mapping. Um, this uh, risk map is actually a finer scale of the Jones et al. hotspot modeling for emerging infectious diseases. And I think that was a really good first start. And Peter Daszak and the modeling team that was involved in, and helped to put this work together is on our team and leads our modeling efforts. Um, and as you can see, the redder areas are the places that are kind of matching up with what I showed you on the previous map um, as the hot spots of where we think diseases will emerge. But this model is really coming from um, the literature and where diseases have emerged in the past. And it doesn't really take into account what's going on now, how diseases are emerging in new areas um, or what's driving them to emerge. So to start to get to that, we need to look at these high-risk transmission interfaces that I mentioned. Land use change, we've already discussed. Uh, hunting is another one um, where people and uh, wild animals are coming into maybe really close contact, dealing with blood and tissues, raw tissues. Um, markets and trade, both live animal markets and, um, and regular markets. Uh, and then this wildlife livestock conflict where you're seeing mixing there. The extraction industries, if you can imagine um, going into a brand new cave to mine that people probably have never been in before, okay? It looks inhospitable, maybe it's full of bats, maybe it's full of bats and monkeys. Um, people probably weren't so interested in using it for shelter in a lot of the tropical areas because you didn't need shelter. So you get people going into places where nobody went before and then what? Sort of stirring everything up and destroying things and mixing in a way that we didn't mix before puts us at high risk. Water availability I think is another huge issue. We're seeing that both in the developed world as well as the developing world. How we share water, um, how we uh, sanitize water. Um, it takes care of those things we look for so we can measure how well we're doing using the same things that we're testing for, but what about all the other pathogens that are in that water that we're not looking for? And then we mentioned how we're moving things around with our very small world now. So what we've done is we've worked with all of our teams in each of those 20 countries uh, to come up better uh, with a map with that interface. So this is the country of Rwanda. The whole country is red. That background layer is that hotspot layer. So if you can look at the background being all red, um, then we have to overlay different transmission interfaces and different high-risk activities like the extraction industries and things that are going on, and also trade and transport routes. And John Brownstein, who's your third speaker, and Health Map help us um, do this kind of work, where we get our field teams 
teams to really gather all that information in the country, and these are local people from those countries, and then feed that back into um, our digital system. And so that helps us to select our surveillance sites a little bit um, more uh, uh, strategically, if you will. Some of our sites are also green on the map because either we don't believe the map because uh, it's based on published literature and some countries just frankly don't have a lot coming out of the published literature or it's not hitting journals that we might search to be able to do this kind of modeling. Um, and in other places we want to have comparative sites where we think that they're, they're really legitimately may be less emerging infectious disease and why is that so that we can try and figure out what the risks are and how to mitigate. We also need to target the right species and taxa for um, testing. And so we've gone to looking at both the literature and practicalities um, about what to, to, where to look in the right kinds of animals. And luckily, they match up. So um, it's nice when your models come out the same way as you intuitively think. So if we, if we look at non-human primates that are very closely related to us, where pathogens are probably shared most easily, and then um, bats and rodents that share our habitats, share our homes um, very well, uh, very easily, um, then we're in closer contact with them. So we're more likely to have more spillover. Now, if we did that just raw from the literature, we would also see carnivores and ungulates as being really high um, taxa groups to look at. Now, that makes sense, right? What do we study? We study our food and we study our pets. So that's why those come up. Um, so if we adjust for how many people are studying the different things, we get this um, really important look at um, primates, rodents, and bats. We don't want to forget the birds, though. I'm sure most of you have had to deal with avian flu uh, risk, and so we don't want to forget the birds. Pigs, really good mixing vessels for viruses, so we're never going to um, take those totally off the list. And then, as I mentioned, the carnivores and ungulates, again, that we uh, live in close contact with. Here's a screenshot from our uh, predict view and health map, and I'm not going to talk too much about that because John Brownstein's going to um, really give you a lot of cool information. But suffice it to say, we also are pulling real time from digital surveillance around the world. So, in partnership with Health Map and Google and ProMed, we're gathering a lot of data and probably improving that system by doing things like putting moderators in places where moderators didn't used to occur. So, they there was an good reporting coming out of those regions. Um, also changing some of the ways that we search um, by including more animal-like um, names. So we don't often say that there's a die-off of people, right? We call it an epidemic or an outbreak, but you might miss an animal outbreak if you don't use the search characteristics like die-off. So um, those are some of the great things he's been doing. We also have um, changed the system a little bit in that we're adding some different kinds of people to the mix. And so what we do in Tanzania, for example, is we have our teams there um, that are our field teams that sort of wait around for scientists and the epidemiologists and the veterinarians uh, and the public health workers to go out to the field. They have a lot of downtime where they're sitting and waiting while they're the other folks are packing up kits or doing sampling plans. And so those guys now, in all of our 20 countries, um, are starting to scan uh, in their local newspapers. So things that would never hit, for example, a normal digital surveillance system, we now have an app where they can upload that information um, out of a Swahili newspaper um, and it gets into the public domain. And it's cool for them because these guys, a lot of them, um, you know, have a primary school education and they see that they're immortal now, right? So our surveillance system is a little more complicated and it's not really a surveillance system. I don't want to overstate. It's really, um, it's really an experiment um, where we're trying to work on how do you detect these new things before they emerge. It is more complicated than that nice straight line box. Um, but now what we're finding is what do we do with the things that uh, that we find? How do we work with our public health um, partners in every country to say which ones are really important and which ones are just new? 
And one of the ways we're doing that is we're only looking for the ones that we think are really important. We're only looking at those viral families or genera that have in them a pathogen that has caused a major epidemic or a pandemic. Okay, so, and then we target those to the taxa that we're studying. So we have developed um, universal controls that we can send to um, our country, our partner countries. We have sent the first control, which has uh, 12 viral families in it, and we're now just sending a second control that has 10 more, because doing PCR testing has been a major limitation in a lot of these places because they don't have controls. So what we've done is we've changed our strategy. So a traditional virus detection and discovery strategy would be either first, if you had sick animals or people, to rule out the eight or to 20 diseases that you think are important in that area that might have that symptomology. And then, if you don't find it, go to something like deep sequencing. That costs, if you don't find it in the first eight to 10 tests that you run, that costs about $3,000 per sample. If you do find it in the first eight you, that you, eight to 10 you tested for in these resource limited countries, that can still cost you about 500 bucks a sample. If we move instead to conventional PCR and we look at these viral families, we can do the same thing basically where we test for all of the unknowns in these um, things. We'll pick up the knowns that we're looking for like a yellow fever, but we'll also pick up new viruses by doing conventional PCR and then cloning and sequencing. And so we have the opportunity to pick up all the viral diversity and a lot more of, the, um, of what's going on. And it only costs us about $300 a sample. So still not cheap, but a huge cost savings. And I guess my message here is, why don't we do that here? I had a mystery disease. I was in the hospital for over a week. I had 104 fever for three weeks. They couldn't get that fever down, almost died. I was released from the hospital with, hope you get better. Um, and so I'm sure some of you as well have had situations or you have to deal with that situation. When conventional PCR is easy, cheap, every laboratory can do that. We just have to switch the way we think about it. I don't mind my physician or me as a veterinarian going for the first um, known uh, symptomatically appropriate tests because it's quick and it's appropriate but when you when you don't get them then um, why aren't we moving to something that's a little bit broader um, to be able to pick up the new things we can do it cheaply uh, this is our laboratory our the first viral diagnostic laboratory and pathogen detection um, laboratory in Tanzania cost cost us 40 grand to build this full molecular lab Okay, with, based on conventional PCR. Um, similarly, we're working in other countries where they may have a lab, but they only have one lab, and so we isolate a piece of that lab with an isoarc, so if they get a hit of something bad, they don't have to um, close down their entire lab. So how's it working? Um, we've trained over a thousand people in laboratories and um, hand animal sampling and handling. Um, we've been able to get testing up and running, started in 17 labs. We've collected over 25,000 animal samples. It's actually much, much more than that, but some, sample, some animals we test, we get one sample, some we get nine, um, but that's the number of animals. We've already discovered 150 novel viruses. Some of those really interesting and important, like new retros, new rhabdos, um, a new clade of Ebola, okay? Um, and we've documented human pathogens in wildlife and animal origin pathogens in people. Um, we think early detection is key to control. And um, I just want to put in a last plug for One Health because I think it is a comprehensive way to look at some of the issues that you all have to deal with on a regular basis. Finally, I think working together, we're more likely to solve some of these um, really tough problems. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was incredible. <laughs> I'm never going to drink milk again. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. David Fisman, who's an associate professor at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health and the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation in Toronto. 
He's a unique epidemiologist who studies the intersection of epidemiologic method and infectious disease surveillance and control, and in particular the intersection between climate change and changes in incidence and distribution of infectious disease, including vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, as well as water and food-borne diseases with environmental reservoirs. And I find this very interesting as the public health point of contact for drought three years ago in Georgia. We really had a very difficult time trying to figure out what to measure and what to do surveillance on um, this relatively long-term slow rise event. And it's nice to know that uh, this work is going on. And, and Dr. Fishman's work provides the much needed research to support epidemiology at the federal, state, and local level in surveillance, but also in preparation um, and response to infectious diseases associated with events of climate change. And after the Southwest, Southeast has been through, let's see, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, fires, uh, we're ripe for having this information. His talk today is going to be on models or muddles climate change uncertainty and future infectious disease threats. And the random fact about him is that he has a brand new 13 week old baby girl. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that's a very kind and probably excessively kind introduction. Um, and I messed up my title, so we're getting off on the wrong foot. But models and muddles is better. Um, OK. So, so here's what I'll, and I'm not checking my email. I'm just going to do this so that I keep myself to time. Um, all right. Uh, so, 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 so what I'm going to talk about is, is just in broad strokes talk about climate change, some concepts, trends, and projections related to this whole idea of climate change. We'll talk about the intersection between uh, ecology and infectious disease dynamics, easiest to talk about with reference to vector-borne diseases, uh, which may be priorities in the areas where you work. But it's also important to remember in terms of water and foodborne pathogens, as well as generally pathogens that have environmental reservoirs. And um, I'm going to speed through so that we get to what I think is the most important uh, points to close, which is, <laughs> as with so much else that we deal with in public health, um, ultimately, the vulnerability uh, to, to climate change uh, uh, related uh, impacts on disease dynamics is going to fall predominantly on populations that are already maximally vulnerable. Uh, and it's important to think that through. So what we're talking about here in terms of climate change, in terms of the basis, and this is not controversial science, um, we, we've had a, a remarkable increase in, um, in um, in, in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution kicked off in the 18th century. So we're dumping uh, uh, many, many tons of carbon dioxide and methane uh, into the atmosphere as a result of economic activities. Um, if we look at World Mapper, many of you are probably familiar with World Mapper. It's just a cartographic program that will distort the surface areas of regions to represent a given attribute proportionately. So if we look at the world represented on the basis of, of carbon emissions, uh, what we see is that, uh, uh, I'm going to use the arrow maybe, what, whoops a daisy, what we see is that uh, uh, high income countries are actually disproportionately dumping carbon into the atmosphere, uh, uh, less, less so uh, from, from China over there, although they have a very large population. What we can see, this is from Gapminder, is that carbon emissions are very much a function of, um, of um, um, per capita GDP in a, in a given country, and that's bi-directional. So the bigger your economy is, the more stuff is going on, the more stuff you're making, so the more carbon you're dumping. But the richer you are, the more you get to play with you know, fun little devices that all, also have carbon footprints, because you get to have all this stuff. Um, so, so there is this fundamental difficulty in terms of dealing with climate change, which is that at its base, this is an economic issue rather than a health issue. This is a bit of a, a sharply worded Doonesbury cartoon uh, where uh, uh, this character is talking to this, this businessman who's saying, look, you know, the science is not in doubt. Where I come down on this is that um, I don't want to hurt my short-term earnings on the basis of potential losses that are well off in the future. And I totally respect that perspective. You know, we're, we're allowed to disagree 
on, um, on, on time horizons and how we value current costs versus future costs. That's a legitimate debate to have. What I don't think is a legitimate debate to have anymore is the degree to which uh, this is actually a phenomenon that's happening. So, the, so there's room for debate on policy. I don't think there's much room for debate anymore around the reality of the science. If we look at global mean temperatures, what you see, this is from the IPCC fourth report, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fourth report. What you see is um, they've represented this quite nicely. You have this sort of sharp takeoff in global mean temperatures. They've sort of done the, uh, the poor person's spline here for any statisticians in the room. They're basically regret fitting uh, least squares regression lines through this curve at shorter and shorter intervals. And what you can see is that the, you know, the red the red regression line has a lowish slope and then the orange is a higher slope and then the yellow is the highest slope. Basically, this is a, a simple way to say, look, uh, global mean temperatures are increasing. They're increasing faster and faster. And in fact, if you look at the bottom part of this figure, and I apologize for my technical incompetence here, um, if you look at the bottom part of this figure, uh, these are climate models. The pink are models that actually incorporate the impact of greenhouse uh, gases on global land and ocean temperatures, and the blue outputs are from, are from mathematical models that ignore greenhouse gas changes. And what you can see is, I mean, I don't do climate modeling, I do infectious disease modeling, but sometimes you find that there's a parameter that if you leave it out of the model, the model system doesn't work anymore. You put it in the model and all of a sudden, voila, the model system works. So that's an example of that. It's very hard to explain the empiric data without invoking uh, uh, greenhouse, uh, uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the IPCC has, um, ha has written volumes and volumes and volumes, obviously. Um, buried in there are regional projections, and uh, the, the projections for North America are several pages long, but to boil them down into a nutshell, the projection for, for, for what we can expect in the US and Canada over the next number of decades is increasing in temperatures, increasing in rainfall, uh, but also increase in drought and wildfire. And that sounds obviously mutually exclusive, but the idea here is that when it rains, it rains like crazy. Um, so we have with that this increased uh, projected frequency of extreme weather events. Here's a NOAA report that came out in 2009 where again, you know, they're trying to manage risk under uncertainty, so we're putting together climate models. Uh, the, the red areas on this map are, are, um, are uh, areas of the United States where you have greater than 100 days per year currently with a temperature above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's your optimistic pro projection. This is with reducing carbon emissions globally by 2080, 2099. You can see that, that, that things really do heat up. This is the high emissions scenario. Um, and you look at this and you start to think, you, you know, there, there, there probably is reason for concern because many of us like to live at least part of our lives outside. <laughs> so, um, at any rate, uh, a lot of this is already a reality. As I say, global mean temperatures have been rising for decades. Global average sea levels are rising um, and northern atmosphere snow cover is, is falling, which has this sort of crazy feedback effect where the dark ocean then becomes more radiant We've lost uh, year-round um, Arctic Ocean cover in Canada, which has resulted in great gleeful hand rubbing uh, among uh, some members of, of our government who are, are pretty excited at all the oil and gas that's down there under the Arctic Ocean um, and uh, the potential for a, a shipping route direct over the pole from Canada to China, for example. But that comes obviously with lots of other costs. Um, you know, usual picture, glacier that was there in 1940, glacier is gone now. Um, so this is very much a reality. Um, in terms of people who are paying attention, I, I had the privilege of being at an IOM panel on indoor air quality and climate change. And uh, there was a fellow there named Frank Nutter, who is from uh, 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 the, the, the US Insurance Institute, I believe it's called who had data in terms of insurance reimbursements for major catastrophes in the United States over time. And what you would see, again, this refers back to the extreme weather, weather events, the, the natural disasters are sort of paralleling what's happening with climate change. The earthquakes, which are the red, sort of remain constant, but the green, which is sort of thunderstorms, winter storms, floods, uh, are going up rather sharply. So, 
Ecosystems are complex biological systems with living and non-living components. Obviously, the non-living component uh, in includes the physical environment, temperatures, water availability, ocean pH, frequency of extreme weather events that can, you know, result in acute changes in temperature, acute changes in sort of physical forces. Um, and, and when you change the non-living component of an ecosystem, you can expect that the living component will adapt either if they're, you know, super smart like us via building things or coming up with new tools or coming up with new strategies, or if they're maybe not so smart like a bacterium or a, a protozoan, but have very short generation times, maybe uh, a Darwinian selection can help you to adapt to that. Um, so we can expect that if we, you know, push a thumb down on the, on the scale in terms of changing the physical components of ecosystems, uh, the living components of ecosystems will, will also undergo dynamic change. So from a public health point of view, many of us are thinking about direct health effects of climate change. Um, probably the most obvious relates to uh, what I've said about temperature where we, we're anticipating more heat events with heat related mortality. Um, injuries due to hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, displacement of populations either directly via climatic events or indirectly via loss of arable land with conflict. Um, but what I have somewhat been thinking about for the last few years, which I think is quite interesting, is that are these indirect consequences on communicable diseases where we may see changes in incidence and distribution of infectious diseases and even more complex causal pathways, for example, enhanced infectious disease transmission via dislocation and movement of populations. Um, so thinking about potential impacts on infectious disease dynamics, again, the easiest to conceptualize is probably uh, diseases that are, are, are transmitted by insect vectors. Um, we, we can have changes in vector ranges, we can have changes in ecosystems that, that um, alter uh, a, a reproduction maturation of in, insect vectors. We can think about uh, pathogens that live in the physical environment. If we change the physical environment, we, we may get changing burdens of pathogens. With all this physical energy uh, that's generated via thermal energy, we may get pathogens whipping around. <laughs> Uh, pathogens that are, for example, sitting on debris that gets blown around by, by, by hurricanes and so forth. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then we may potentially see changes in, in communicable diseases, which I'm actually more or less going to leave alone because it's, it's, it's not really clear what the direction of that effect is. So f I'll focus mostly on vector-borne disease. This is not that hard to conceptualize, especially for a Canadian who grew up, you know, in the 1970s when it got really, really cold in the wintertime in Canada, not like this past year when we were sort of sunbathing in March. Um, so the current scenario, or the former scenario, uh, for a disease like West Nile infection, for example, this is a picture from my colleague Amy Greer, we have snow melt, we have overwintering mosquitoes who are living in, you know, their merry little catch basins, they wake up, uh, uh, lace megs, um, uh, larvae develop, we may have some uh, uh, transovarially infected larvae that grow up into inf in infectious mosquitoes. We have this bird, mosquito bird amplification cycle, and then at the tail end of all of this, we have so many infectious mosquitoes that the bridge mosquitoes start biting people, and by August, you know, we're seeing West Nile infections in, in, in humans as sort of collateral damage of this bird mosquito bird amplification cycle. In a warming scenario, we have onset of spring temperatures coming much earlier, so the eggs get laid earlier. Larval development is, is, is thermally sensitive, so the larvae grow up faster. So basically the amplification cycle is just going longer. So the opportunity to amplify up to a given level and then have bridge vectors bite humans and infect humans just becomes that much greater temporally before we have sort of this, this autumn or winter freeze. Um, for ticks, we, Lyme disease was an exotic infectious disease in, in, uh, in, in Canada until recently when I was in medical school. I graduated in 1994 and our teaching at that point was that you could only get Lyme disease in Canada if you went to a place called Point Pelee uh, Park, which is a peninsula that juts down into Lake Erie and it's about at the same uh, a latitude is Northern California. Um, and at this point, we have fairly widespread Lyme activity. Part of the issue is that, you know, you have uh, tick vectors that need multiple feeds 
uh, between uh, s spring melt and the fall sort of freeze up in order to achieve their you know, lifetime goals as ticks and, and make new baby ticks. So you, you need this tremendous uh, temporal space between uh, spring and autumn in order for ticks to actually uh, complete their life cycles. And as that sort of uh, climatic elbow room has become greater and greater, We've seen ticks now uh, able to complete their life cycles further and further north. This is from a colleague at Public Health Agency of Canada, Nick Ogden, who tried to do some climate modeling related to where we might see Lyme in Canada, you know, under different scenarios. This is sort of a middle of the road, neither optimistic nor pessimistic scenario. And so what Nick is showing us is, you know, by the 2020s, we might see it in Ontario, 2080s, it might be up in Alberta. But then, of course, some of you have seen this. This is from Calgary. Uh, where we had a case of human granulocytic uh, anaplasmosis, which shares the Ixodes tick vector of Lyme disease in an 80-year-old gentleman who came into the emergency room at University of Calgary who hadn't traveled outside of Calgary in a number of years and was walking his dog in local parks. And we know now that we have, have, um, have tick-borne disease that aren't supposed to be there well north of, of what the projections were. If we look at the United States, this sort of a standard map, we made this out of some uh, data that the CDC has on, online in terms of state level Lyme disease counts. So looking at risk quartiles, um, as, as has been pointed out, John Kerry country tends to have high rates of Lyme disease. Um, you have Lyme disease rates going up in the US, but if we look at the rate of change within states, the states that are going up are farther north, the states that are sort of uh, not really changing much or in the middle, and then we have some, some decrease in the, in the southeast, which again may relate to, um, to um, uh, climate effects. Looking at the latitude of state centroids as a proxy for how far north you are, what you can see, this is just a meta-regression plot from those same data. Uh, we were asked by a reviewer to kick out the southern states, so we kicked out the southern states and it's the same, same effect sort of have this latitude related change in incidence rate ratio year on year. Um, we can think also, so that's sort of over the longer term with, with, with uh, longer periods between um, a sort of spring melt and, and fall freeze up. We can also think about more acute short term effects of climate change. This is work by Jonathan Soverow, who um, uh, was an epidemiology student at, at Harvard when he did this. Jonathan managed to get a couple of years worth of West Nile infection data from different states from the US CDC and then looked at this using a case crossover study design which we don't have time to go through in detail but suffice it to say this is a way to control for underlying seasonality of risk and what we basically do you can think of this as a, as a self matched case control study where each case day is actually the case it's not the person who's the case it's the case day and then we look at temperatures upstream or, or precipitation or whatever our exposure is upstream from that case period. And then we pick a control period. And what's funny about this design is we actually have random directionality of the control periods uh, for, for, uh, because you basically introduce bias if you always look backwards and you always look upstream when you have seasonal diseases. At any rate, this is work that Jonathan published in a couple of years back looking at, at Lyme risk, uh, at West Nile, excuse me, risk for individuals uh, based on lagged precipitation, lag temperature. And what you can see is that as you go back, temperature seems to enhance West Nile risk probably in a bunch of different ways at longer lags, probably by a speeding larval development at shorter lags by getting the mosquitoes all hot and bothered and having them bite more. Um, uh, figure C shows the impact of heavy precipitation, which is also somewhat uh, 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 predictable when you get in big pools of water you've all of a sudden got these wonderful um, breeding areas for vectors and so forth. We've gotten very interested, my, my little gang has gotten very interested in El Nino recently. Um, there are a bunch of different ocean oscillations that happen. One of the interesting things about ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, is that a lot of the effects uh, represent a bit of a microcosm for what we're expecting to see more regularly with climate change. So extreme weather events, you know, geographically variable, but elevated temperatures, um, uh, uh, more precipitation and so forth. And El Nino events are irregularly spaced, so it becomes kind of a nice natural experiment. We've been playing a little bit with um, National Hospital Discharge Survey data where we can look at, for example, vector-borne diseases and um, this is what's called the distributed lag model, which maybe I 
can't figure this out, maybe. I have to point it at that. Oh, all right, all right, well. Ah, okay, so, so that funny squiggly thing that looks like someone fluffing out a blanket, what that is is, is, is over there, yonder, in that, in that corner is, um, is lag, so time zero is today, that's, when, that's the month that we're studying. Time 12 is a year ago. And what you can see is the ENSO index we're using goes on a scale from three, which is very El Nino-like, to negative three, which is very La Nina-like. Um, and what you can see is, as that El Nino index increases, the relative risk increases, 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 increases. That's 1.8 at the top, not 0.8. But you actually have this bimodal hump where last year's El Nino index also seems to matter, presumably setting the stage for, this includes both ticks and mosquito-borne diseases, setting the stage for populations next year. Um, and so we can use approaches like this to look at lag defects that may mimic what we see with climate change. I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to zip through physical environment in 10 minutes, okay. Uh, physical environment and disease transmission. Um, so let's think about water and foodborne disease. Uh, many of you, <laughs> if you work, in particularly if you work in local public health departments, will know what a big deal foodborne illness is. Um, is an important source of morbidity in North America, and we know this even though we probably undercount foodborne disease cases by something like 95%, we think. Uh, and we have bacteria, protozoa, viruses that cause a variety of, 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 of enteric illnesses. A clue to their sensitivity to environmental conditions possibly uh, relates to the marked seasonality of these pathogens. So we, you know, you can somewhat, in Toronto, you can somewhat set your watch by norovirus season. If, we, if you're vomiting, it must be December. Um, and, and similarly, we have bacterial and protozoan pathogens that have, have, have summertime seasonality. So that may suggest an environmental uh, impact. And we, we see the same thing with some mnemonic pathogens like Legionella that have this marked summertime seasonality. Um, and, and that may happen sort of in terms of elevating baseline risk, but also coming back to these extreme weather uh, events, large waterborne disease outbreaks have been linked to extreme precipitation events that we think are supposed to become more common under climate change scenarios. So this is, this is basically, we made this out of data from a woman named Dominique Charon, who some of you may have heard of, who, who works at, at uh, the Canadian version of uh, USAID, which is the, the, the IDRC, which is the, uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, uh, International Development Research Center. Um, and Dominique was very interested in have any of you heard of the Walkerton water disaster in Canada? So, so, we, so we had this terrible, very large, veritoxigenic E. coli outbreak in a small village called Walkerton, which has widely been ascribed to the fact that we had two drunken idiot brothers <laughs> running the town's water supply. <laughs> and um, the, the Cable Brothers, this is all out there. There's a commission report you can read about the drunken idiot Cable Brothers. Um, who realized that if they just, for, water, for their water testing records, if they just wrote zeros everywhere, you know, it would take less time away from their drinking. Um, so, so the Cable Brothers have sort of been demonized, but what Dominique pointed out is that what you also had going on in Walkerton around that time, on this backdrop of municipal incompetence, was 50-year rainfalls and 100-year rainfalls. It was a heavily agricultural area, a lot, of, a lot of cattle in this area, a lot of people in rural areas drinking from wells. And uh, so the environmental uh, uh, correlate, you know, you can't prove causation, is that there were tremendously heavy rains which may have washed environmental contaminants into people's drinking water. And we had taken away that public health seatbelt in this particular region allowed this disaster to happen on a smaller scale, although presumably a lot of this was missed. We can think about an event like Hurricane Katrina that was sort of whipping salt water all around uh, the southeastern United States uh, with, with these reports of, of, um, of um, unusual Vibrio infections, non-cholera, uh, non-toxigenic Vibrio cholera and other Vibrios occurring in, in the, in the um, wake of Hurricane Katrina, so to speak. Um, and we probably can anticipate that we will see unusual um, outbreaks or clusters of infectious diseases in association with extreme weather events related to generation of aerosols, inoculation by uh, air or waterborne debris, 
Um, there's data from Australia on, um, on melioidosis, which is sort of a tuberculosis-like illness uh, that's seen in, in tropical areas. That it's an environmentally abundant pathogen, Burkholderia pseudomallei, if it's still called that, I hope. Um, increases, uh, increases in incidence following monsoon rains where presumably environmental uh, contamination is being blown around. South Asian tsunami, we saw reports of, of clostridial infections and atypical mycobacterial infections after that extreme event where again debris and water are getting into people's, um, into people's skins and into people's uh, sort of uh, uh, living areas. We can think of this, this is, a, uh, this is a figure that was drawn to describe how cholera dynamics might change under, under, under climate change. Now cholera is a person to person transmitted disease indirectly through an environmental in intermediate. Um, and what, what these authors were suggesting is if we think of the reproductive number of an infectious disease, cholera may have uh, or does have uh, a thermal requirement in, in order to sort of stay abundant in, in um, in, in estuaries where, where salt and, and fresh waters mix, and that you may actually drive up the staying power of Vibrio cholerae in, um, in, uh, in those waters by increasing water temperatures, and might as a result see increasing cholera uh, incidence. Um, Legionella is not a communicable disease, it's an infectious disease that's not communicable, but that also has an environmental reservoir. These are some old data from, um, from Philadelphia that we looked at a few years ago. Uh, where uh, there seemed to be a sudden surge in legionellosis cases. We looked, legionella is profoundly summertime seasonal in Philadelphia, but when we looked with a case crossover design again, thanks, what we found was that precipitation seemed to be strongly associated with downstream legionellosis risk, as did humidity. It's hard to tease these apart. Um, finally, we can talk about sort of the physical environment and the movement of pathogens that are abundant in the physical environment. Um, and we can also um, uh, talk about sort of uh, washing of pathogens into source waters and so forth, drinking water as a result of extreme weather events. It's also in terms of enteric uh, illnesses and environmentally abundant pathogens, there may yet be a vector tie-in. This is some, uh, some data again from Philadelphia um, from, uh, from a few years ago looking at the summertime seasonality of Campylobacteriosis and seasonality, the red is a, is a model and the gray is uh, is, um, is actual data. Um, now, why should Campylobacter go up in summer? I, the usual explanation is that it's the sort of what I call the Homer Simpson effect, which is you have all these people going and barbecuing chicken inadequately on their barbecues, and that's sometimes trotted out as, 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 as why we get more Campylobacteriosis in summer. But there are other things that change in summertime. For example, um, there's, a, there's a fellow named Gordon Nichols in the UK who's noted that human cases actually lead on chicken contamination in the UK. When you have very granular data on Campylobacteriosis contamination of chicken in the supermarket and Campylobacteriosis cases in people, people actually get the Campylobacter first. So we may be giving it to the chickens rather than the chickens giving it to us. His hypothesis, which I think is interesting and is the climate tie-in, is that fly generation times actually drop off profoundly as temperatures go up. And flies represent, you know, a life form that enjoys nibbling on poop as much as they enjoy nibbling on your piece of chicken, for example. So a greater abundance of flies in the summertime and that, that, that process sort of increasing as temperatures warm could, could result in surges in Campylobacter. That's obviously at odds with certainly trends we're seeing in Canada, which is a slow, steady decline in Campylobacteriosis. So I'm just about at time, so I do want to talk a bit about mitigation implications for vulnerable populations. I, I love this paper. This is by someone I do not know, uh, Dr. Brunkard, I assume, at the CDC who looked at this wonderful natural experiment on dengue seroprevalence at the Texas-Mexico border, where you basically have a city, which is Brownsville, Texas, Matamoros, Mexico, that's one city that has a fence down the middle of it. And the mosquitoes don't really care that there's a fence, so they presumably fly back and forth. The people live on either sides, and you've got markedly different seroprevalence of dengue on two sides of a border in this single geographic area. And when they looked, you know, were modeling, looked at what the risk factors were for being dengue seropositive, being impoverished, collecting your water on the roof, uh, not having air conditioning in your house so you kept the windows open at night, and so on and so forth, all of those emerged as the major risk factors for, um, 
for uh, dengue seropositivity, basically talking about attributes of living on the Mexico side of the border from a socioeconomic point of view. So to a degree, lucky countries can mitigate their way out of at least part of this. And to a degree, this, I, I, I agree, this sort of would cause one to damp down some of the, the very shrill arguments that come up around, uh, you know, we're gonna have dengue epidemic in Chicago. I don't know that that's the case. There's some reason to think that will not be the case. Um, but that said, here we go again, you know, the folks who are most vulnerable to the health effects of climate change, uh, this is from Dr. John uh, Balbus, who I believe is at, at uh, NIOSH, at that same Institute of Medicine panel. It's the usual suspects. We have the elderly, we have children, we have um, um, uh, low-income individuals, uh, we have the immunocompromised, we have individuals with, with cognitive and mobility constraints that under climate change scenarios, we anticipate that these are going to be the folks who, who bear the brunt of, um, of the health impacts. And here's an example from the, the London heat, heat event in 2003, where we had uh, uh, sort of a marked increase in mortality in the population of London. But if you look at that by age, it's almost entirely restricted to older individuals. So in conclusion, global climate change does have major implications for human health. Those are, those are probably geographically variable though. Um, we can anticipate that impacts on ecosystems are gonna change the distribution burden of vector-borne infectious diseases um, and other infectious diseases, that should say, including bacterial disease. And there's some reason to think that these changes are already well underway. In terms of mitigation, again, the infrastructure exists for less vulnerable individuals to protect themselves. Again, it's going to be folks who don't have resources who are going to bear the brunt of any changes that come. And finally, this is my usual soapbox, so, but I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, I, I think that if you have dynamic change going on in disease burden, the only way to understand it and anticipate it and react to it appropriately is via public health surveillance because if we don't have strong surveillance systems, we're effectively flying blind. An example of that is, is, was our situation in Canada where we didn't have Lyme disease being a nationally notifiable disease because we weren't supposed to have Lyme disease in Canada because it doesn't come that far north, so why would we report it? Um, and then, so it's, it's kind of the tail wagged the dog and people started saying, well, there's tons of Lyme disease here and then it became a nationally notifiable disease. But wouldn't it have been much smarter to think, well, we could be vulnerable to Lyme disease, so maybe if Lyme disease moves into Canada, we would want to know about it. So we had a bit of a, t about a 10 year lag on Lyme becoming a relatively commonplace in Southern Ontario and Lyme becoming a notifiable disease. Of, n disease. And of course, there are other diseases with potential climate climate links in my context, these relate to echinococcosis and blastomycosis that are not reportable, I don't think, in either country. So we are a little bit flying blind on some of this. Um, and at any rate, with that, I will thank the many, 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 many people who I have worked with over the last couple of years for making all of this possible and happen. And thank you. Good morning. I'm Sharon Watkins with the Florida Department of Health, and I have the privilege of introducing our last speaker, Dr. John Bronstein. Um, just housekeeping, we hope that we have um, a chance and an opportunity to ask questions for all speakers at the end. Dr. Bronstein is a professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School. He has joint appointments in Children's Hospital in Boston with the Harvard MIT Division of Health Services and Technology as well as the Division of Emergency Medicine. He was trained as an epidemiologist at Yale where he received his PhD. And he primarily works in infectious diseases including HIV, malaria, dengue, Lyme disease, West Nile and others. What he's currently working on and what he's most known for is combining spatial modeling, GIS, and surveillance of public health disease for which he was Google funded. He's a leading developer of the GIS-based disease surveillance system called Health Map. We saw some of those maps in our first talk. And this provided one of the earliest indications of novel HIN1 virus in 2009. 
For this work, he re recently received the prestigious Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers in 2010. Health Map is in wide use by the CDC, the WHO, HHS, and others. He advises the White House, WHO, and um, among others, and is um, reported on health-related issues in a variety of um, venues, including the BBC, NPR, the New York Times. And for those of you who heard um, our talk last night, I think we all have renewed respect for the ability to successfully communicate health disease issues to the media. Um, please welcome Dr. John Bronstein. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. All right, that was quite a nice long intro. So. All right, well, thanks very much. I'm going to um, hopefully keep this short so we have some time for questions. I'm going to be talking to you about a, a, a new field. Actually, it's been around for the last 10, 15 years, but really has come to its, into its own in the last few years with the advent of Web 2.0 and mobile technology. I'm going to start actually by talking to you about a conference, actually not CSTE, but actually the Canadian University Press Annual Conference that was held earlier this year in Victoria, BC. And just like CSTE, they've gone really into social media. Um, for those who use Twitter, you, you'll recognize a hashtag, which is the idea of organizing content on Twitter. Nash74 was their hashtag. I think you have one here, CSTE conference hashtag, I think that's one. Um, but they use their hashtag not to communicate information about uh, interesting things that they are seeing in the conference, but for something slightly different. So one tweet came out, motion that nobody else on this bus puke, hashtag Nash74. That's interesting. Then followed by more tweets about a gala being shut down. Luckily, the last night's gala was not shut down, but because too many people were sick, followed by more tweets about people being ill on the, in the hospital, I mean, in the hotel, on the floor, of the, uh, getting sick on the stairs, zombie horror film <laughs> emerging, actually a picture, actually, of an ambulance coming to the hotel, and just on and on and on until after 36 hours later, uh, things got back to normal. And so what we essentially saw is a live tweet, a, a, an outbreak unfolding on Twitter in a matter of hours and then subsiding. And this tells us that there's you know, some interesting things people are communicating, of course, on Twitter. But, but in reality, if we are able to harness this kind of information, uh, say here in this case of a norovirus outbreak, we could have actually legitimate, useful information from public health surveillance standpoint. So of course, there's a norovirus outbreak, but there's many other events that are playing out in the forms of Twitter and social media. And if we look at the stylized epidemic curve, there's all sorts of information that's being communicated at the same time via Twitter, via Facebook, emails, blogs, chat rooms, news media, all sorts of data that's siloed in different parts of the web that could potentially be useful from the point of view of public health surveillance. So the challenge really is how to make that data useful. You can imagine the amount of false alarming and issues with this kind of information, but how do we organize this content properly? And of course, yeah, a norovirus outbreak is one example, but what about thinking about the emerging infectious diseases? Say this is uh, a map showing 400 major events as described by the WHO as, as internationally significant. How could these data sets have been useful from the point of view of early detection of, of these particular events? And so we spent a couple of years actually dissecting each one of these events, trying to come up with time points of, of the disease detection, when it was communicated to the public, when it was laboratory confirmed, essentially retracing the entire event process for each of these 400 disease, disease outbreaks, which unfortunately wasn't previously documented. Important uh, to note is what we were really interested in is the time from outbreak start to its discovery and then eventual public communication. How long does it take and is that time point changing over the years? Um, as you can imagine, especially in, in places that are, have lack of public health infrastructure around the world, it takes time. It takes on the order of a few weeks before something's discovered, over a month before the public even knows about it, over a month and a half before even the WHO issues a report about it, an event. And of course, from our knowledge of the importance of, of early detection and communication, that's of course not good enough. But what's interesting is that we are seeing an improvement in time where it took maybe on the order of months for an event to be discovered and communicated to the public in the mid-90s, now that's taking on the order of a few, a few weeks. So we're seeing an improvement in time, and so there are many factors that are, that are coming together to improve our ability to detect events in populations. But one of those is a changing in the way that information is flowing in, in public health. And this is preaching to the choir in terms of understanding how information flows from the public to public health and local public health and lab confirmation, eventually moving up the chain 
to essentially a world body say as such as the WHO. What we've seen though is a change in this hierarchy of information where this one-way flow of information that never trickles its way back down to local we're seeing a change with the utility of digital disease detection. The data that is outside these traditional channels, data that exists and is freely available and, and allows for transparency is data that's improving our ability to know about events and communicate information. So the rise of digital disease detection isn't a phenomenon over the last few years, but it's actually been ongoing for, since the 90s. Uh, ProMed, we've heard a couple mentions of ProMed already the first infectious disease social network, truly, because that was the idea of communicating a, a, among a group, an informal group of 50,000 infectious disease um, experts around the world. GFIN, which is actually a Canadian product, the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, was the first idea of crawling the web looking for news reports of infectious disease. And since then, there's many groups, uh, governments, academic groups, um, even companies that are coming together to think through how to meet this challenge of this incredible data that's out there on the web that one, that one can organize information and make useful uh, and people are taking all sorts of different perspectives on this, on this approach. So I'll just talk from my perspective in developing a system called HealthMap over the last six years with the idea that we wanted to essentially be Google for public health organizing all, and in fact funded by Google to do that eventually, but the idea that we could organize all the world's content on public health issues, on emerging events, organize that information in real time, and make that information available to all stakeholders. So not necessarily make it a login password protected site that only ministries of health get access, but really make it available to anybody who is interested in, in emerging disease, and actually make a very specific effort to engage consumers in public health issues. This is our uh, local public health uh, link that allows people to see essentially like the weather.com for disease events in their neighborhood. It's not at the level of weather.com, but we're trying to get people to care a little bit more about the diseases that are happening in their neighborhood, and I'll, I'll give you some ways that we're trying to do that. So how does the system work? So how does a tool like this even become useful? Because there's so much content, there's all this data out there, how does one try to organize this data? Well, we tap into over 50,000 websites every hour looking for particular keywords about disease events. We do this in 10 different languages, actually it's gonna be about uh, 12 in the next week. We're doing this every uh, hour, looking for particular markers of disease events in different news media stories, blogs, social networks, across the web. And that results in about 2,000 new disease alerts uh, every day. Now, you can think of the mismatch if there were only 400 major events that were reported by the WHO in 15 years. There's a mismatch, of course, which is interesting, but also a challenge from the point of view of validation of this kind of data. Um, and at, once we collect that information, it's precisely placed over 10,000 locations around the world. Of course, you can we're trying to take free text data of, of discussions, people's talks, people's communications, whether it's news or in social media, and trying to turn that into to a structured database that becomes useful from a public health standpoint. So we're organized by disease, by location, by number of cases. Essentially turning a, a structured communication dialogue into an actual database that's useful from a surveillance perspective. You can also imagine all this data is incredibly noisy and hugely um, variable. So the idea is that we're trying to organize content, essentially like your Bayesian, a Bayesian filtering process, like a spam filter in your email, where we organize across five different uh, categories where we're most interested in sort of breaking news or warning. Maybe there's an environmental situation that might lead to a disease outbreak in a population. So we're filtering out all content that's less useful from a surveillance perspective, and then organizing content. You can imagine the same event, same discussion over and over and over again in the media will be discussed, so we organize that content, cluster it, and then rate it. So essentially, if you, I don't know if anybody has Netflix, but the idea is people can come in and rate their, uh, their outbreak event, and we crowdsource that information, and then make that available uh, on the map, on an interactive map. So our goal is as soon as there's any communication about any infectious disease on the web, that should be on health map within, uh, within the hour. One classic example that was mentioned in the intro was around H1N1. So, in fact, the earliest report that, that we could document came out of, not out of an official source, but out of the local news media, uh, Spanish media um, newspaper talking about an unusual mysterious illness that was taking place in Veracruz, Mexico. This was weeks before there was any official confirmation of, of the cases in Southern California, and especially well before any Ministry of Health confirmation of the event. Now, this is interesting and exciting that we could say that, you know, informal data, these kinds of information sources were useful, but in fact, it's easy to say that in retrospect, and, you know, 
there are many different events that occur in our system, hundreds of respiratory events that occur that don't turn into a global pandemic. So what's, what's a challenge for us is to think through what are the unique characteristics of these kinds of reports that would clue us into this turning into a global phenomenon. What's potentially more useful um, for the systems currently is that they provide broad global situation awareness. So because the system organizes content from both official and unofficial sources, we can actually provide a situational awareness view both for domestically but also for the world that provides a unique view. So for instance, we could provide a trajectory of H1N1 from country to country using the integration of all these data sources that is quite unique and, 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 and different from what you might see from other sources of data. Now, domestically, so it's not just necessarily looking at H1N1 in a major event, but even minor foodborne uh, disease outbreaks that are taking place can be potentially useful from this system. So, for instance, the CDC reports about 1,000 new events, foodborne outbreaks, every year. Now, once again, we see this mismatch because a health map is reporting about 10,000 new events. So you can see this either as a blessing or a curse, where we're providing this, this, this national view on, disease, on foodborne disease outbreaks that aren't necessarily getting reported to the CDC, but are also may or may not be validated. So, it's, a ch so it's, it's exciting in that we're able to provide a new view of data that's unlike anything else, but at the same time we have to think through how we're going to be, be able to validate this kind of information that is coming through these informal channels. So the way that we're trying to attempt to do this is what we think in the next generation of public health surveillance is an area we could term participatory epidemiology. So it's the idea of tapping into experts, public health officials, public health students even, but even the general community, and trying to provide us input into what's happening in the community. So whether it's new events or validation of existing events, we're trying to build the public back into public health. So the first way we did this is through an iPhone app called Outbreaks Near Me which basically is the idea that we can organize content coming from our, uh, from our system but make it ge geographically interesting. So essentially, you turn on the app, and feel free to download the app now if you like, it's free. Um, give it a five-star rating, please. Um, so the um, people are very brutal on the, on the rating in iTunes, by the way. Um, so the idea is that you have location-specific information, sends a message to our server in Boston, we send back a message with all the disease events happening in your neighborhood. And this is just a screenshot from the iPad version. The idea is that turn on the app, you see all the disease events. But what's more critical to this app for our perspective is that actually you can start to report into the system. So you can report in a human event or an animal event and tell us anything. We didn't actually know what people would do. We just put that out there and wanted to see what people would do with it. And in fact, people started to actually um, download the app and actually use it. And so since there was some interest in the, uh, initially over 100,000 in the first month, we built it for the Android application, and actually there is a new Android version that's in the, in the Google Play Store now. We then, of course, recognized that people don't have smartphones, so we allowed people to, to send to call us, a voicemail, and people actually have done that, or send us an SMS. They can use Twitter, so they can send us a message via Twitter, um, or even just report via the website as well, and people do that quite a bit. Um, our least successful uh, mode of, of, of data is uh, through our Facebook app called Outbreaks Near Me. Um, <laughs> people do not want to download a Facebook app and put it on there and then start. But anyways, we'll, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to work with Facebook to, to improve, you know, every, you know, maybe build it into Farmville or something to, to make people <laughs> care more about it. Um, the other way was just actually to get people maybe a little bit scared about pandemics. Um, and so we actually worked with the film Contagion um, to actually insert our, our work into their social campaign and into the film to actually engage people and have people actually think more clearly about emerging infectious diseases. And all those channels together have actually allowed us to actually collect quite a bit of data on, on particular events that are taking place. And I don't have time to go into um, all the types of events that we get, but they're a broad range from syndromic surveillance to real physicians that are telling us about, about disease events that are happening in the population where, for instance, the Ministry of Health isn't being transparent about what's going on in the population. We also get a lot of garbage too, but I'm not going to show you the photos uh, that we collect, um, some pretty freaky stuff coming in. Um, <laughs> So anyways, I'll leave, leave it at that. But the idea is that we can also, in aggregate, for instance, be able to, t to provide early indication of, say, in this case, H1N1, where our data provided some evidence for the rise and fall of the second wave of H1N1. Now, this is only based on you know, thousands of submissions. If we're able to increase our participation 
in the app, then we can, of course, build more value out of the data that's being collected. We're also thinking through ways of engaging people more clearly in the way that they, the people use the app, recognition, maybe some people use Foursquare, the idea of like potentially there's a point system becoming a digital disease detective, or thinking through other ways to engage people more clearly in the system, and also building a disease detective network. So for instance, we get a lot of undiagnosed events in health map uh, each year, and every, uh, well, and for instance, we don't know actually what's happening, um, and we don't have a lot of validation. This is an example of an event that took place last year in northern Thailand, where there was an un undiagnosed event in Chiang Mai. But what we do know is that we have a lot of iPhone users and Android users in that particular area. So if we're able to query those people and actually ask them for information about what's taking place, uh, right now we can actually create a surveillance system that actually allows us to validate an event for essentially zero cost. So we have an ability to actually get a little bit more contextualized information without actually doing any work and actually sending out, for instance, a field team as an example. Of course, you don't actually have to ask people for their data. They can, you can just take their data. Um, and this is, was a principle between Google.org's flu trends, which was an exciting idea of using query information, what people search for on the web, in terms of around flu symptoms, to actually build somewhat of, a, of a, an epidemic curve around flu. Whether that model works for other types of events is still yet to be seen. We actually worked with, uh, with Google on another project called Google Dengue Trends, which actually we showed using being able, scraping um, official li literature to actually uh, look for validated uh, data sources, we're able to actually produce a, a product that actually produces pretty high accuracy of, uh, of dengue epidemics in about 10 different countries. And so there is an ability to think through the other types of, of data streams that might be uh, of use. The, the trick is that you need a lot of people uh, using these tools, and if it, you don't have a, a lot of internet access, you don't have a lot of morbidity, these types of systems are not gonna work very well. We've also been thinking through how to use these systems in disaster settings. Of course, everybody here is familiar with the cholera, cholera um, emergence in Haiti. We've been, we spend a lot of time working with the crisis mapper community, trying to think through how to build a real-time map of risk in, in Haiti, and also not only just produce risk, but also integrate information on, on a basic public health infrastructure. We also recognize and we attempted to do surveillance on the ground uh, to get information not only about cholera but, uh, but about other disease events and that was of course extremely challenging. Um, and so we turned to other sources and one of those sources was Twitter. Um, and we thought about, well, can we actually mine tweets about cholera to actually think through whether that, that data is of, of, of use whatsoever. And in fact, um, we actually could build an epidemic curve of the cholera outbreak matching against um, some official data. In fact, we validated our models against David's work um, on, on, on cholera modeling using official data streams. What we found is that, that Twitter data was useful in the first two uh, epidemic waves of cholera, then people's interest sort of wanes, and so we don't actually have any enough data to tell us something about the follow-on uh, follow epidemic. But for the first two, we are actually able to pr provide some really early information about the transmission, the, the r not for, um, for cholera that was highly within the range of what was, uh, that came out from official sources. So for a first look, for an ability to quickly look in an event and say, okay, what, what level of transmissibility are we seeing? Potentially Twitter data and other types of social media streams could actually be of value. We're actually trying to do a better job of, of Twitter surveillance. We actually just launched, in collaboration with Penn State University, a project called CrowdBreaks. You can go to crowdbreaks.com, which is this idea of organizing all the Twitter content, any, any discussions about any symptoms or diseases, and this was actually part of an HHS challenge that came out called Now Trending. Um, and so we launched this product in collaboration, and essentially the idea, and this is also built into HealthMap, the idea is that now we have contextualized information. Any event that you click on, you can actually see the amount of tweets that are going on about that particular event. Now, we're also thinking about how to put the public more directly back into uh, public health. And yeah, putting out an app and just seeing what people report in is, you know, is interesting and can be uh, valuable, but we want to take it to the next step. And so we launched a project last fall called Flu Near You with the uh, American Public Health Association and the Skoll Global Threats Fund um, with the idea of providing a sentinel network that allows people to report in weekly about their symptoms. So the system is essentially a one-stop shop for flu, integrating data from the CDC, from 
um, from Google Flu Trends, providing people resource, but what was important about this system is that it's the individual that's reporting weekly about their symptoms. And people get an email every Monday morning, and I, hopefully some people in this audience are flu members, um, but the idea is that you choose from a list of 10 symptoms, say whether you had fever, say when you had sick, and then, quick, and then within 10 seconds or five seconds, you're done uh, reporting for the week. And then from that, um, we've actually started a challenge. Challenge is not over, so if there's people in this audience that want to get involved and recruit people into the system, there's actually a lot of money at stake. Um, but so far, we've actually gotten thousands of people, actually close to 8,000 people in the system that are providing weekly uh, symptom information, um, and then actually providing us very useful information. Now, of course, we didn't have a, a significant flu season this year, so it's gonna make it hard from a validation perspective. Um, but so we're still in the process of thinking through how to really utilize this information. And this is quite similar to efforts that have gone on in Europe and in Australia around sentinel flu tracking. And what's also interesting is that um, the age distribution is not necessarily all skewed towards the younger age groups. We're actually getting a fairly decent representation of the population. So one might expect there's a very bi there's a strong bias to the 20-somethings, which there is to a certain degree, but we're getting a fairly good representation. We're also allowing people to report in about their household members, so we're actually getting detailed information about kids as well. And so from that, we're actually able to provide a fairly decent picture. Now we have still a lot of work to do in terms of how this is representative, but there's, there's a lot of promise for this type of a tool. And hopefully, well, not hopefully with the bad flu season, but if there happens to be one, we'll have a lot more engagement. Um, and then the last thing I'll just mention is that a lot of criticism of these efforts is, is that we're just putting out risk information and we're, not, we're spending a lot of time just putting out risk, but we're not allowing people to understand what to do. And so our first effort in this space has been actually um, to take over a project from Google called Vaccine Finder, um, which actually organizes data from all um, pharmacies, well most pharmacies, over 50,000 sites across the US where chains like CVS and Walgreens are putting in their data about the supply for their flu vaccine and, and allowing us to map it and make that available. So we're working with flu.gov out of HHS to essentially organize all that content and now people can put in their location, get access to where they can get a, a shot and how much that'll cost. And we're building up that product to not just be about, um, about flu, but, but a variety of vaccines. And so to make it a one-stop shop for people to know where they can get their immunizations outside, of course, from their, their practitioner. So I'll just leave it there so we can have some time for questions. I mean, the idea is that these, these data aren't supposed to necessarily replace public health efforts, but they are important and they're difficult to ignore. So I think the message here is really thinking through how to tap into the, to these information streams because they're happening, the dialogue's taking place. And I think from a public health standpoint, to stay ahead of that information, one needs to be looking at it. And so I think there's, we're just really at the beginning uh, of, of this kind of concept, but I think there's huge potential in public health for these data streams. And I'll just thank the Health Map team and funders and uh, look forward to questions. Thanks a lot. We started a little late. I think we'll have some time for some questions. If you need to go to poster sessions, please get up and leave, but we will also stay here. Is that okay with the speakers? That's okay with you? Um, so go ahead and direct your questions. There are two microphones. Um, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. No random information is necessary, and I'll let the speakers respond. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Jeff Miller. I'm a preventive medicine resident in Pennsylvania. Um, I am a former EIS officer, and I very much enjoyed this session as somebody who responded to the uh, first yellow fever outbreak in Uganda in 35 years in 2010. And so the confluence of, uh, in the session of um, talking about the PREDICT program and also talking about uh, new technology for surveillance is sort of very close to home for me. Um, or close to Uganda, as the case may be. So um, I, I also appreciate the last slide in um, mentioning that you don't think that these approaches should necessarily replace traditional surveillance. Um, and I'd like to give a plug for traditional shoe leather epidemiology um, and human surveillance. Um, so in Uganda, with this yellow fever outbreak, um, 
we had news reports, media reports, that variably called it typhoid, Ebola, um, Marburg, plague, uh, and ultimately wound up taking a lot of really hard work to figure out that it was yellow fever. We couldn't get LFTs done. We had trouble getting CBCs done. I worked with Mike Cranfeld with the UC Davis group who was just fantastic um, and really, really well equipped and staffed. And it, it was kind of embarrassing that on the human side of the outbreak, we were grabbing supplies from Mike and his group because they had better supplies than we did to be able to get samples. The other issue here is one of a case definition. Um, and certainly when you're talking about H1N1 where the uh, prevalence is really high, the positive predictive value of your test or of your report is gonna be much better. Um, but we had people who were very concerned about this, quote, strange disease that was causing hemorrhagic illness. And our case definition, if you will, was so broad that we were catching people who had a bloody nose and were, um, you know, coming in to, to the clinics. Um, and so, uh, you know, ultimately the amount of yellow fever that we found was quite low. Um, so I, just a plug for a traditional shoe leather epidemiology. Thank you very much. Um, I th think we have time for a few actual questions. Hi, I'm Faye Sorhage. I'm the state public health veterinarian for New Jersey. <coughs> New Jersey, excuse me. Um, anyway, um, in my job, I'm involved with vector-borne disease surveillance recognition. And one of the things in the United States when West Nile hit was how poorly prepared most of our states were to do any sort of vector-borne mosquito surveillance by, or even, you know, mosquito prevention and control efforts. There was like zero capacity in some states. So some of that did get developed with grants from CDC, but now I kind of feel like the focus is falling off there and we're actually, despite what you're saying about the increase in vector-borne, we're starting to lose our capacity in the United States for vector-borne surveillance and prevention and control. So I, I don't know if you all can answer this, but is is any of these connections with recognizing what's coming, hooking up with universities to train more people in entomology and vector-borne um, disciplines and hopefully stress to the states to provide grants to maintain vector-borne capacity? I guess that was kind of a big question. But <laughs> is, is this big or okay? Um, I, yeah, I, I would respond to that in, in two distinct ways. One is that um, I think what's happened with West Nile probably relates to the fact, and I had the same experience, I was a public health officer in Hamilton, Ontario, which is a little city near Toronto when West Nile emerged, and we heard rumors and drumbeats that, you know, horses were sick and that crows were on people's lawns. We had absolutely no infrastructure to integrate human and animal disease information. I think it's better now, but it's not great. Second comment, I think you're hitting on one of the meta challenges for public health, which is that we, you know, we fight the last war and then when the war is over, we sort of have the, I mean, and, and it's not necessarily public health units or, or, or jurisdictions that are to blame for this, but to a certain extent, our funders are driven by screaming headlines and the crisis of the day. So if the good that you're producing, you know, which we produce when we work in public health, if the good that you're producing is a negative, is silence, is non-occurrence of events, you know, that's our product. We make disease not happen. There's a tendency over time for people to just think, oh, well, you know, this is just the world that as, as it normally is. Disease doesn't happen. So why on earth are we funding these efforts when there's nothing going on. I think you see that. Uh, we have a, an interesting character mayor who's the mayor of Toronto right now. There have been some discussions about you know, these vaccine preventable disease programs when we don't really have that much of vaccine preventable diseases. You know? <laughs> um, so so, so I, think th I think that's kind of a meta issue for us. What I, in terms of clarifying what I was trying to say about West Nile, I think the initial emergence, what you saw there, and this again speaks to why it's so important to understand the whole ecosystem what we saw in people with relatively high case counts, we had about 400 human cases in Ontario, that must have been just Armageddon for the birds. 
because it was a newly emerged, basically, bird pandemic. So what you saw was the collateral damage in human populations following this bird pandemic. That, we know there was a massive die-off because you could sort of see them everywhere. Um, and subsequent to that, what you're going to get are you, you're going to get sort of the damped, um, damped oscillations in, uh, in, in epidemics in birds. You're not going to have the big pandemic again because you have a partially immune population. So what you're going to see are these spillover epidemics in humans that ultimately come to some sort of endemic equilibrium. Now, what I'm saying in terms of climate change is the level of that endemic equilibrium should go up. So I'm not saying that, you know, the world gets hotter and it looks like it looked in 2000 or 2003. What I'm saying is, you know, things like Eastern Equine, West Nile that are presumably going to equilibrate should be happening at a higher level than they would otherwise as endemic threats, not as epidemic threats. Oh. Let's take one more question. Just also validate, though, your point about entomologists. I think we do have a global dearth problem of entomologists. And, and I think universities are, are training them, vector-borne disease specialists and entomologists at the PhD level. But that's the problem, to go to the previous person's point. Um, the shoe leather entomologist is what we're missing. And we're not training them well because people don't want to get a PhD and then go back and identify mosquito species. They don't want to do it. So we probably need a training program more at a technician level for, for entomologists um, that will really be able to help us globally. Let's have one more question, and I think our speakers would be happy to talk after. Hi. Hi. I'm Erica Samuel from North Carolina. Um, to Dr. Mazak and, and potentially also to John Hadad, um, what are evaluation measures for your surveillance system? What would you consider success? Can, can you not hear me? Um, yeah, how do you, what makes, given the limited funds for public health, which means that we don't have enough entomologists, among other things, we don't pay our PhDs enough to get them to do anything necessarily, um, given the limited funds, what makes a system like that be worthwhile? How can you see that it's worthwhile? Yeah, it's a great question and a good follow-on. If we're successful, no one will fund us anymore because um, we will have helped to stop things. So, of course. Um, so uh, I think we have several measures that we're building in. One is, are we detecting new things? And then can we say we have now detected the level of diversity that's out there that we should be shooting to evaluate? Um, that's kind of a very sciencey evaluation measure. Our, our on-the-ground evaluation measures are really, are we diagnosing events more quickly? Are we picking them up and diagnosing and then responding to them more quickly anywhere? Um, so that is here, that is in the countries where we're working. So it really is the, the primary assessment is the shortening of response time and then the ability to keep something local that potentially could have gone worldwide mention one thing. I mean, it's, um, it's difficult because, of course, you know, it's all the, all the usual metrics of sensitivity, specificity, timeliness, all that. But what we don't get a lot of is feedback. So we know that we push out a lot of information to local, state, public health, and CDC, but we don't, there's no, not enough time to get feedback.